Hi, everyone. Welcome to our conversation with Abbott Elementary's Lisa Ann Walter. We're super excited to have you here at IFF, and we're really excited to have this talk. Um, so this is the second day of Ivy Film Festival. We'll be going until Sunday, so please keep your eye out for any events coming up. And starting tomorrow, we will have a drink at GLOW, which is on Ive Street, to support our Emerging Filmmakers Fellowship. So please stop by and get a drink. We get $5 per drink. Um, and so it really goes to support young filmmakers of color um, coming up in the industry. So yeah, really excited to have you here. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Vivian to introduce the event. Thanks. Hi guys, thanks for coming. Um, like Anna said, I'm Vivian. I'm another one of the festival directors. Really excited to have you here for festival week. Um, as Anna said, there's events all week long. After this, we'll have a screening of You Resemble Me and a talk back uh, moderated by me. Um, uh, so please feel free to come to that. And we also have many more events every day this week, including a filmmaker mixer at Glow on Thursday night, a party Saturday, our official selection screenings Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and a screening of Evil Dead Rise, scared of that, on Sunday. Um, so definitely come through for all of those and visit us on the main green every day, um, except for Thursday and Friday is gonna be one to 3.30. Every other day is 10 to 3.30, selling our wonderful merchandise made by the branding team. Now, without further ado, I would love to introduce our wonderful moderator, Maya, who is actually our third co-director. Um, Maya is a sophomore here at Brown. She's studying modern culture and media and literary arts, and she's involved with everything you could imagine, including IFF, BMP, and more. Um, she's a filmmaker extraordinaire, and I'm really excited to hear her have a conversation with Lisa. Um, so, yeah, welcome, Maya. Hello everyone. Um, thank you, Anna and Vivian, for such a beautiful introduction. I'm Maya, one of the festival directors for this year, and I am very honored to be in conversation with the wonderful Lisa Ann Walter. Um, just to give you a quick little intro, Lisa is an actress, creator, producer, and writer. Her career spans television, film, and the stage. She is currently starring as Melissa Shimenti in ABC's number one show, the Emmy-nominated Best Comedy Ensemble SAG award-winning show, Abbott Elementary, um, which is Quinta Brunson's. Yes, give it up. <laughs> the show, um, as I'm sure you all know, um, is Quinta Brunson's homage to the hardworking teachers and staff of our nation's public schools. You may also know her as the beloved Chessie from, might I say, the best film remake of all time, The Parent Trap. Um, <laughs> so yes, please give a warm welcome to the wonderful Lisa Ann Walter. Yeah. Hi. Hi Lisa, thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Do we need these really? Honestly, if you feel like you want to project, I, 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 I'm trained to project. It's more, it's for the video. Oh, you need it for that? Well, then I will use it. I just can't get it to go right to my, is that good? How about now? No? Good. Not good. All right, hi. It's perfect. Sorry. No, you're so good. Hey, hi Brown University, how are you? It was a beautiful day today out in the green, and now we get to end it with a conversation with Lisa Ann Walter. Like, how could it get any better? I, it couldn't, really. I don't think so. <laughs> All right, so let's get into it. Um, let's. I'm just, I just want to say before yeah. we start, I'm really thrilled to be here. You guys have truly one of, no, I'm going to say the most engaged student body. I, I will tell you a little secret that I, that I told the ladies when we were backstage. I toured this campus when my daughter was looking at schools in 2010. And um, the minute you step on campus, everywhere you look, you see students engaged in conversation and excited and passionate. 
and excited about where they're going. In every single department we went to, it was the same. And I was, I was really blown away by it. It was very tangible and different from the other campuses we visited. She didn't get in, <laughs> but it was exciting nonetheless. And as you see, I have not held a grudge, because here I am. Yay! And she's getting her PhD now, so that's fine. <laughs> she did okay. <laughs> well, I'm glad you didn't hold a grudge. Oh, no. It's okay. I have a drinking problem. This is a safe space. <laughs> I'm glad you didn't hold a grudge. And Thank you. And might I say, IFF is a true testament to the engagement. Um, that students have here at Brown. I think all of our members are very, and all of the people in our audiences are very just attuned to what our goal is and they love supporting these events. So thank yay. you for being so here. Yay you. Yay you. <laughs> all right, okay. So Abbott Elementary. Yeah. Yeah. It is it's a good show. It's a, I mean, I would say so, right? Uh, yeah, you know what? I have done over the years um, a number of projects, many, mm -hmm. many projects. And there have been some that you do as a mother of four children that I know of. Um, <laughs> thank you for getting it. Uh, there have been some that I've done to pay the bills because mm -hmm. I was a single mom living in a very expensive city, Los Angeles. And there have been jobs that, you know, people, family or friends say, why don't you tell me you did that job? I'm like, you don't, you don't need to watch that. It's fine. This is a show that I very proudly mm -hmm. brag about. And in fact, if people... It, including my 22-year-old my twins, um, weirdly born on the same day as the twins in The Parent Trap, but I have identical boy twins, and they have not watched the show. And I'm like, what are you doing with your life? It's like, yeah. it's a really funny show, and it makes people feel good. So I'm super proud to be part of it, and very, very um, grateful to Quinta Brunson, who's the best boss I've ever had. That's she's incredible. amazing. Yeah. Truly. I mean, she is not just really good at what she does, and it's it's wearing a lot of hats. It's starring in a show. In between setups, she is sitting on the ground looking at wardrobe choices, looking at uh, background players and doing casting for day players for the next episode and going over story notes. And then she leaves the set and she goes into the writer's room and she works there. And I mean, she is an amazing, competent young woman, mm. tiny young woman. <laughs> And, um, and she's just the nicest person in, that I've ever worked with. Forget about four. And she puts everybody in the, in the show that she has hired is also nice. So it's an incredible gift to be at this stage of my career and be on the best project I've ever done, arguably. That's lovely. And I'm, yeah. I feel like maybe you answered this already, but through the show's success, what has been the greatest realization or lesson that you've learned? Never give up. Mm. Yeah. And hear that, y'all. Yeah. Because no need to elaborate, this yeah. is, I mean, I have been, I've been knowing what I wanted to do when I grew up since I was five, mm. six, started working in theater when I was a teenager worked in, uh, in theater was, you know, lucky enough to land some jobs when I was, working in DC and, um, you know, I, I, and that's what I thought I would do with my life. I thought if I am lucky, I will be a stage actress and I'll work in a, in a company like Arena Stage in, in DC or the Guthrie mm -hmm. in Minnesota and I will do great work and I'll be satisfied being on stage because I was good at it and I loved it. And we moved to New York and I did some off-Broadway and I immediately got pregnant. And um, it just turned out to be something else that I was quite good at. And, <laughs> and, and uh, as when I had the baby, I was like, well, I made a human being. I can do anything. And I started doing stand-up. And that led to being offered to do TV shows in Los Angeles and, and do the job Quint is doing, co-create them, write them, star in them. It's a big job. I was not nearly as good at it as, as she is. But... Um, there have been a lot of years in between where I, that were very lean. Mm -hmm. And being a, a single working mother in, in Los Angeles and paying for kids, that's a big job. And there's a lot of years where, we were talking about this backstage too, the only, as a creative, you have really one job besides the job that you chose that you're passionate about. And that is to stay doing it and to get up every day with optimism. And even though everything in the world tells you 
what are my chances of making it? Or how do I know I'm gonna land this, or I'm gonna sell this script, or I'm gonna direct this movie, or I'm gonna do what I love? Really, it is your job to believe that you can and you will. And you, and by the way, don't wait for the person to green light your project. Don't wait for someone to tell you you can. You get up and, I don't have my phone, you get up and you shoot what you shoot with your friends. You get the friend that has a red camera or another digital camera and the friend who has, uh, you know, the, the cast that they put together and don't skimp on the sound, pay money for your sound. That's yes. the advice I will give you. You will wreck your project if you don't have professional sound. But you get up every day and you make your, your work yourself. You write it, you do it, and somebody eventually will pay you for it. And if they don't, you get up the next day and you believe again. And then someday, it happens. Mm. And you don't know when it's gonna be. You have no idea. You might be an old ass lady like me. <laughs> but one day, I mean, there have been projects that I've, I'm very proud of along the way. But in terms of a job that you, I can relax and say, I can pay my bills this year. Mm -hmm. I can, the, the remaining children still sleeping in my house will get their last years of college and, and I can pay for them. So, you know, it's, it's really just belief. That's all, that's all the magic is. And that's what I've learned on, on this show is that you just keep going until it happens. For me and for my, my castmate, Cheryl Lee Ralph, mm -hmm. we have very similar trajectories in our career. Always working, continue to work all the way through Sometimes against some odds, you know, people, she couldn't get cast because there was a, uh, there was a, a prejudice against casting a black woman in a lot of roles that she should have been considered for. In my case, I was a, a body type that they didn't cast in certain roles or, you know, now. <laughs> I look at how I looked back when I went to LA and they kept trying to make me lose weight. And I was like, are you sick? What's wrong with you? I was fantastic looking. But they <laughs> yeah, you were. looked awesome. Yeah. But <laughs> thank you. Thank you. But I mean, honestly, there was just um, some things that are going to be a, a, an, an idea in the minds of the people that write the checks that you should be a, a certain type of way. And I think that that's changing. Thank God mm -hmm. that's changing for the better, that all versions of our experience and, and diverse worlds are looked at as being worthy of a story being told. And again, don't wait for them to tell it, you tell it. Totally, completely. And I think it's so beautiful that you're telling us this now. Um, I came up with these questions before I last, the, before I watched the most recent episode of Abbott Elementary, where mm. you give Eddie a pep talk. Mm. Um, oh, Greg, Gregory Eddie, yeah. Yes, uh -huh. Gregory Eddie. And you tell him, um, you can't choose when people acknowledge you. How profound is that, especially in relation to your Come, career I'm gonna, path? I'm gonna cry right now. <laughs> as well as Cheryl Lee Rouse. And I think a lot of this, and a lot of what you've just spoken about, is heavily related to being a woman in this industry. And I think you have a lot to say about that. A, a, a woman in the industry and a woman over 30 yes, in the industry. Exactly. Because up until very recently, my young friends, <laughs> up until very recently, there was a, a real attitude. And, and there's a reason for it. The people that are in charge, that they give the power to green light mm -hmm. projects, are almost um, universally men. And, uh, and white men, mm -hmm. and they have an idea about what you're supposed to look like when you are the love interest. And it's very stereotypical. They don't do this to men as often. You know, you are uh, curvy, so you're gonna be the sassy, slutty next door neighbor. In fact, I named my first production company Ingenue's Funny Friend. Originally, it was <laughs> Ingenue's Fat Friend, but I'm like, I'm not gonna help hate myself, yeah. so. <laughs> Let them do it. And then, you know, if there was a, a TV program, there might be one lady over 40 or over 50 on the show, but she was like the sassy broad. And she was the only one. There was one. It was her, and it was played by Betty White or whoever. <laughs> and that was it, you know? That was the attitude lady. Now, thank God, mm -hmm. people like Quinta Brunson, uh, one of the most amazing things that she has done with this show, besides be incredibly focused about the depiction of the world that she's showing and the neighborhood that she's showing and the people that she comes from 
and, and making it real. And for whatever reason, she was lucky enough, well, for whatever reason, Channing Dungy is the president of Warner Brothers. She is a black woman. She listened to this young black woman. Mm. The people in ABC got out of the way and didn't say, we think we might know better. They let her voice come through. They let her tell her story. And that's why it resonates, because it looks real, because it is. It is based on real life. Part of that was the friendship of my character, Melissa Schmenti and Barbara Howard, played by Cheryl Lee Ralph, the, the work wives that people respond to and that they love because it looks real. First of all, Cheryl and I have a genuine friendship. We sat down on day one of shooting the pilot and we had met once before and discussed politics. I think it was at, a, at an AIDS charity event. And, um, but very briefly, from the minute we sat down on the pilot, we started telling stories about raising our kids in Los Angeles, being single mothers, shopping for bargains and the racks at the back of the store. Mm -hmm. and, and we just got along so beautifully. And a friendship, a real true friendship was born on that day. I don't always take a friend with me from a project. Um, occasionally, I, I did an episode of a show called Strong Medicine that was on Lifetime. Whoopi Goldberg asked me to do it and play a comic going through menopause. I was like 35. I was like, why are you rushing me? <laughs> but I, she was like, girl, you'll get to write material. You can use it later. <laughs> So I, I said, as long as I get to write my own jokes, and then she let me, so I did. And I had a, a great friend I pulled from that, Rosa Blasi, who was one of the stars of the show. When I did The Parent Trap, I met Elaine Hendricks, who played Meredith Blake, and she is my best friend mm. in the world to this day. Yeah, um, yes, mean-ass Meredith Blake, <laughs> and, but she's Your lovely. Yes, she is my best friend. So, I, and in this show, I got Cheryl, the gift of Cheryl. And she is, she is truly, I mean, we text each other pretty much daily. Mm. Um, she's not a big texter, by the way. She does a voice message. <laughs> so she's, she, is that you? Yeah, she's, this is what I get, girl. <laughs> and then, like, I know it's gonna be yeah, a story. A... There's gonna be a story. <laughs> so, um, so being the, given the gift of two women over 50 who are best friends, like you would see in real life, mm -hmm. She's not gonna buddy up to the young kid. I mean, yes, she does, because Quinta's writing those stories, but also two people who have been ride or dies for each other, who have known each other for decades, who depend on each other, know each other's life stories. That we don't see as often on TV. So I think that it is progressive and feminist and beautiful to show that story. And I am, um, I'm thrilled to be her her partner in many scenes. And to go back to your original question with the, the quote that you can't choose when people are going to acknowledge you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I love Tyler James Williams. I love everybody in my cast. I am lucky enough to be surrounded by, truly, and having come from theater, I can say this, the best ensemble cast I've ever worked with. Mm. Every single person is brilliant and really good at what they do in creating these characters. Chris Perfetti, I didn't know his work. He came from theater in New York. He's brilliant. Tyler, I knew as everybody hates Chris. Yeah. He's brilliant. He is, first of all, the most savvy of all of us in this industry, like business savvy. Mm. Qu Quinta would be like, what do these numbers mean? And he's like, well, let me tell you. This is what <laughs> And everybody's just so good at what they do. I didn't get to do a lot of scenes with Tyler. They didn't write them. Because, you know, they're, they only have time for a certain amount of stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, Barbara Howard and Melissa do scenes together. I do some stuff with, um, with Janine, with Quintus' character. I never got to do a, a storyline with him. So this was new. It also came after an entire award season where all of my castmates got nominated for awards except me. <laughs> No, it's hilarious. Because, um, you know, I know the reason they can do the work they do is because I'm there too. I know. Yeah, of course. Um, and, and also, like, I'm not upset at all. Like, I'm the, the biggest cheerleader for everybody. And, you know, I sob my eyes out when any one of them wins an award. And when Cheryl won, it mm -hmm. was one of the best days of my life, truly, that she won, that she got what she deserved after all those years of being unfairly marginalized and overlooked. 
Um, so I am thrilled to be a cheerleader for everybody. But my, but Quinta and my executive producers, Justin and, and Patrick, and the other people are very kind about calling me up if the oh, uh, nominations come down for the Emmys or whatever and I'm not on the list. Just know that we love you. We know your worth. We adore you. And, you know, it's, it, it can be, and I think you'll learn this as you move forward, that when you see other people doing something, it's hard not to feel like uh, it's a race. Does that mean yeah. they got something that I didn't? Mm -hmm. Is there not room for me because they got? No. I mean, it's not your time. It's just not your time. Maybe yet, right? So I think that they wrote that line for me to say because it was so meaningful for Lisa to hear. Mm -hmm. So having to tell someone else you can't choose so when someone acknowledges you. It doesn't mean that you're good or deserving now or you're not good or deserving later. You just can't choose it. And it happens for a whole lot of reasons. And a lot of them other reasons than having to do with your talent or your ability. So it was real, it, I, thought, I, thought it was, I thought it was stealth. It was a little stealth um, <laughs> and sketch that they like gave it to me to say. But no, it was, it was cute, it was cute. And, um, and I love doing that scene with them because it, it is meaningful, it's a good lesson. Totally. I mean, the show just feels like, especially these characters, they feel like conduits or vessels for things that we should be talking about or should be focusing on, like female friendship and, and being, or not the passing of the baton, but that people can coexist in spaces and you can still learn no matter what age you are and you can still... That be, theme, yeah, that yeah. theme carries a lot, I think, on, on Abbott um, and, and it crosses... Mm -hmm from, you know, the older to younger, certainly, you know, there's the old, you know, teachers, stalwarts that have been there forever, giving lessons to the young people, and then we learn from them. And we have white characters learning from black characters, and black characters learning from a oh, gay character, and, you know, it's not, I think that the beauty of it is none of it is, and I think the re one of the reasons people respond to the show is that none of these messages are done in a ham-fisted way. Mm. This show is not, and the lesson for this episode, bam, yeah. you know, you get, you know, in this 22 minutes, we learn that Melissa really loves herself. You know, I mean, whatever, <laughs> whatever it is, you know, you don't, it doesn't come that way. We did a whole episode about, um, oh golly, what was it? It was like the computer thing that they wanted and Barbara couldn't figure it yes, out. And then at yes. the end, it turns out that they were using that information for the school to prison pipeline. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all like, that's bad. Yeah, and, that is bad. But it wasn't the point of the episode. It was literally just a line at the end, and you go, oh, oh okay, that makes a really good point. Yeah. But it, it, that's the beauty of the show, is it makes great points without it, you're being told this is mm -hmm. the point. They do it with humor, so which I tend to think makes uh, messages a lot easier to hear when it's I, funny. I completely agree. Excuse and me, everybody. No, you're so good. Take your time. It's dust. <laughs> um, this is yeah. gross. I should turn around. <laughs> it's okay, we'll give her a moment. Like an animal over here. Go ahead. <laughs> I told you, this is a safe space. Okay, go. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, speaking about comedy, especially a show that is so poignant and makes all of these points about the reality of the world, it does it through comedic means, and mm. you yourself are a stand-up comedian. So, what about yeah. it? What about this? Form? You know what's bizarre? What? Fully half the cast, more than half the cast on Abbott, either has been a stand-up or currently does stand-up. It means, must be the funniest set. It's a lot in of fun. World. I'm not gonna lie, we have a good time. There's Janelle James who's killing it all Hilarious. over the place. Still to this day, is like selling out rooms. I came up as a stand-up, as I mentioned, which a lot of people don't know, but that's what gave me the, the golden ticket to Hollywood. And throughout the years I've done, and you know, I was doing it then, I was making a living doing it. I had uh, a couple of kids. I was doing stand-up until three days before I had my second child, my daughter, and went back to work when she was five weeks old, on the road. I was still nursing, like pumping into a Ziploc bag. <laughs> uh, we're not, it was, it was a lot. but. Um, yeah, and I, I doing it again and out on the road and selling out rooms and it's just, I, 
it's magical. It's really nothing like, first of all, the reason I ever did stand up in the first place where there were things that I had to say. Mm -hmm. I didn't see women talking about the stuff that I wanted to talk about and what it was like to do the plate spinning act of, as I used to say, raise a family, find a cure for cancer, have a flat stomach. Like trying to do, trying to do everything and be great at everything. And I wasn't seeing that voice in stand up because there weren't that many women. You guys were in a generation where half the comics are women. You wouldn't know that from the lineups at the clubs. Still just one woman on the show. But uh, you know, there's a lot of female voices out there and it was not like that when I was coming up. There was maybe two, three dozen of us all over the country. Mm -hmm. And nobody had kids. Me and maybe Roseanne, and maybe one other <laughs> person were the only ones to have kids. So I had to, there was stuff I had to say. And now again on stand-up stage, there's stuff I have to say because things are going terribly wrong, children. Terribly wrong. In this country. Yeah, terribly wrong. <laughs> all I have to say is if I were known we were headed toward the Handmaid's Tale, you would have wearing better. those red robes, I wouldn't have cut out carbs. <laughs> I would love to get into that point. I mean, not, not the car point, but the, the trajectory of the country. I know you it's grew quite up alarming. in and around D.C. I did. I was an activist my entire life. Mm -hmm. I was a feminist my entire life. I got my first big money that I spent was my allowance money on, on Ms. Magazine the first oh year God. it came out. It's absolutely true. It made me so popular. <laughs> um, back then, it was not cool to say that you were a feminist. You would have boys going, why do you hate boys? Why do you want to use a boys' room? Like, there was just, it's not like it is now. It was not cool at all. But I was down in D.C. marching for the ERA and for reproductive rights, and here we are still. Here we are still. And again. Yep. So, that's fun. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, honestly, it's, it's the, the reason that I was inspired to get back on stage and, and talk, because there are things that, you, that have to be said and protections that we have to fight for, and uh, so that's why I'm doing it again. And so it's me, it's Janelle, um, Stan Davis, who plays Mr. Johnson, was a stand-up, used to tour with Alonzo so Bowden. Um, yeah, yeah, he's great. Go ahead, clap it yeah, up for him. clap it up. I love him. He's my neighbor. He comes up to the house all the time. We had a watch party for when Quinta's SNL came on. Oh, we, we watched yeah. the Super Bowl together. We have, <laughs> we have a great time. Um, and, and Quinta did stand up, but she hated it. She didn't like stand up. She hated it. She, likes, uh, she liked sketch stuff and improv, but she was not a big fan. She didn't like the world of stand up because it can be quite mean. Mm. You know, there's like some back of the room kind of, you know, just like mean guy energy. So she's just not, she was not built for that. I mean, obviously she, she's built for whatever she's doing now. All of it, all the other all stuff is what she's built. Everything else. Yeah, yeah. except stand up. No, yeah. <laughs> she, she just didn't like it. I bet you if she decided that she wanted to kill it, she would, but she just didn't like it that much. That's so, but, it, but you know, there's a lot of us on set that can, if we, you know, it took a minute for us to not go, well, how about this tag? Or how about this line? Like, our writers are doing a great job. They don't yeah. need our help. But every once in a while, we'll throw in a line. I and, love, oh, the Sicilian slang, that's all me. I put all that in. I love it. Yeah. It's, it really just adds to the character. Yeah. I think. Yeah. Yeah, but it's not their world. The writers, it's none of them have that background. So mm -hmm. I'll be like, yeah, instead of saying guy, can I say jabroni? And they're like, yeah, 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 say jabroni. <laughs> jabroni. Yeah. Get yeah. it from the source. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, I'd love to speak more about that. Is there, what is your experience with operating within this scripted form when stand-up is so improvised? Well, stand-up is, for the most part, not improvised. I mean, yes, you do mm -hmm. can, there might be something that happens within your act. A lot of times things that look just a little secret, you guys, a little industry secret. A lot of the times you see stand-ups doing stuff that you think is a, an ad lib, and it's not. They've said it a thousand times. They just make it look like an ad lib. They pick somebody in the crowd to talk to directly, and then whatever it is they were going to say, that's coming at you, but it's not an ad lib. Um, so we are uniquely positioned mm. to deliver punchlines that we have said from the table read, that we've gotten tired of, that we're saying again, and make it look fresh and make it look new. Um, we write. We're writers. Mm -hmm. and, and those of us who are, you know, take the stand up very seriously. Look, I write on stage too. Like there'll be stuff I've never said before. It just comes out of my mouth. And then I'll just be like, somebody write that down. That was great. Um, 
but all of us are used to being coming up with the funny that suits our character because mm -hmm. we know ourselves and what makes us funny. The writers learn to write for your voice. You might have, you know, if you're a writer and you're writing different characters, the way one person communicates is not the same. If it looks the same throughout the entire script, you're hearing the writer's voice, not the character's. And when I write, for whatever reason, the characters very easily come through me and they all sound different. They, they get their, my, in my case, more words rather than less mm -hmm. usually, right? Harder lines rather than soft. If you see me do soft lines, that's the other side of Melissa Schmenti. Mm -hmm. That's the other side they know I can do and Quinta is brilliant at it and all of our writers on staff. They know that I can do in one scene real hard sounding stuff the talking heads are good for that, where we're talking directly to camera, mm -hmm. because you're seeing what the people think or feel that they're not saying around their, uh, the other characters. But sometimes they're also not saying it in front of the camera. You just see it. Mm -hmm. You see. That's the subtext, right? So being able to do all that, all of our writers are really good at. And then every once in a while, it's the end of the scene, and it's the button, and I'll say something just as the you know, because the cameras are still ro rolling and Quint will go, keep that, that's funny, that's good, keep that. <laughs> and a lot of times it's just because we've been hearing it for a week. So we're just, we're tired of it. So anything new is funny. Mm -hmm. And then the other half of that is we're just really freaking funny. You are. Yeah. That sounds like such a generative environment to be surrounded by writers. Quint is a writer, you have the writer's rooms. And hey, Janelle's a writer. And exactly. not just in stand-up, she's written on... Um, uh, a couple of other things too, Black yeah. Monday and some other things. So yeah, we're a bunch of writers. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, it's I annoying to the writer sometimes, honestly. Is it? Is it? Yeah, you'll find out. <laughs> that's, that's good to know. <laughs> um, I would love to talk more about the resonance that the show has had. I mean, it showcases public school teachers in Philadelphia and the tireless efforts that they make to uplift their students in conditions that aren't necessarily working in their favor. Um, so why do you think, I mean, personally, I know that I started watching the show and I immediately felt a sense of comfort and familiarity because it reminded me so much of my public school and the teachers at my school, my Mrs. Scamenti. Mm -hmm. um, so why do you think the show has so much resonance and what do you think it has done in its wake? You know, I'm, I'm pretty convinced that what you mentioned is a big reason for the success of the show, and that's that people feel comforted. Mm. They feel warm. Um, the thing about half hour television is, especially network television, which is bizarre. I'm sorry, I feel like I'm turning my back to this side of the room. <laughs> Hi. Um, <laughs> the thing about network TV is you, you have to want to, and, and this is different from maybe, um, uh, SVODs, you know, the, the HBOs and, you know, where you're, you can have some characters that are not necessarily likable and you still have half hour shows, you know, like Veep, where everybody is sort of creepy, which I found to be <laughs> I, one of the funniest shows ever on television. I loved it, yeah. but it's, it's that edge to it. It's not 30 Rock, right? Mm -hmm. Which similarly has nutty characters doing nutty stuff around a neurotic female centered character, but that's network, Veep is not, right? And the difference with network television is people have to want to invite you into their home every week. Come have dinner with us, come with our family. And the wonderful thing that we hear about Abbott is that all generations are watching it together. And it is the best thing we can hear. When, when Quinta is told, I watch it with my grandchildren, or my mom and I watch this together, or our whole family comes together to watch it, as a family, that's the way, that's what inspired her to want to do network comedy, is that she grew up with some of these shows with Everybody Loves Raymond and some of these shows that she just made her family come together and watch it and laugh together. And that's what she wanted to create. So not only does that mean that we are fulfilling what the creator wanted, which is lovely, but it's also very good business. Because when you're selling to multiple demographics, as the networks say, mm -hmm. you get to sell a lot of stuff. So it is, it's, it's the bloodless 
you know, answer is, wow, this is great for the, for the network mm -hmm. and how the corporation is making money. That n never mattered that much to me. I mean, yes, I love feeling safe and being able to raise my children and knowing that I've got a job tomorrow. That part's all good after the strike. But I mean, that part, that part is, sorry to be a downer, but it's gonna happen. Um, all of that is great, but what really is meaningful to me and what has always been meaningful to me, I was lucky enough to do The Parent Trap early in my career, relatively early. I'd been working for 15 years, but in terms of being out in LA. And it was a, a role that people, have, throughout the years, and it'll be 25 years this, this June, wow. right? 25 years, people have told me throughout that all of that time how much the character of Chessie meant to them, that they felt comfortable mm -hmm. with her and safe. Queer people have said, I felt accepted by that character, like I could come out to her, like she would love me even if my family didn't. And I think there was something to those twins having secrets, <laughs> the twins being, keeping something from the grown-ups, but, but my character knew. And, and said, let me help you and I love you. And I think that that to me, if I had just had that in my life, just that character, it probably would have been enough because I was given so much love for it over the years. But the fact that all these years later I get to do Melissa Shimenti and I hear similar things from people that they feel safe, that they feel loved by the show that we do is for me as a performer and as a creator is the best thing I could hear. I'm, I'm so entirely grateful to be on this show and to be playing this role. That is so beautiful. Yeah. And honestly, I can, I can relate. And my little brother and I, this summer, we watched The Parent Trap. I was away. I was doing a little project at Brown, and he was at home. And we watched it on Disney+. Plus. We shared screen. Aww. And it was just a way for us to like be, feel the familiarity and the comfort of this yeah. character and this movie that we both love. Yeah, I think yeah. people, audiences have responded to Abbott in a way, and they tell us, they let us know. I said to Quinta when we shot the pilot, if we only have teachers watching the show, we're a monster hit. And I'm pretty sure we're gonna get teachers because mm -hmm. I had not seen a show that reflected teachers the way they looked in a community that was truthful to what this community was. And it hadn't been seen yet on television. Um, and so I was, I was pretty sure about that. But when they, um, but when I saw the response, first on black Twitter, which was incredibly instrumental Huge. in making this show a hit, mm -hmm. and then on everybody else's Twitter, <laughs> I was like, oh, they're, they're welcoming us. Yeah. Quinta's already little cousin Quinta, and everybody, I, I was Auntie Lisa. You're Auntie Lisa. I was Auntie, and I was like, Oh my God, thank you. <laughs> I was, uh, I never felt more invited to the barbecue, never. I love that. I was, I mean, it was really, I, I truly got that this was gonna be a hit mm -hmm. and that we were looked at like family, like mm -hmm. family. And that I thought was part of, was the reason why it became so popular. I completely agree. Yeah. And speaking of the masses, mm -hmm. we'd love to get some questions in here for Lisa. If anybody has a question, raise your hand. I have a question. Um, ooh, uh, what would you say um, to uh, a young actress who, like me, who wants to work and succeed in the industry that doesn't accept the way she looks, or wants to change the way she looks? Well, this is what I will say. There, coming up in stage, as I did, the way someone looks is on stage is anything you want it to be. Feel me? Anything you want. If you are, if you want to change your eyes or you want to feature a different color hair, that's what the wigs are for. That's what prosthetics are for. That is what, how you change your walk. If you, I don't know if you do method, but uh, if you, if you change who you are from the inside, you know, walking with a chest lead or walking with a hip lead makes you a different person when you hit a stage, right? So the internal of who you are, you could be anything in a play. Now in terms of how you get hired when there are powers that be that make decisions from the top down, yeah, it's annoying, it's creepy. You know, there was a big 
back in the day, if you were, let's say, uh, if you were a larger black woman, the part you were going to get was going to be this woman here. That's what you were going to get. And that's it. Mm. You weren't going to be educated. You weren't going to be, listen, I've got this. And I was blonde for a long time because I got cast in a, in a movie called Shall We Dance where they wanted platinum blonde hair. And they wanted me to gain weight. And when I got done doing that project, I got a movie that Steven Spielberg cast me in. I had already started to change my hair back and I auditioned for War of the Worlds and I went in and they were like, no, 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 we want the white hair. Mm -hmm. They want the porn blonde hair. So I had to dye it white again and I kept getting cast with that hair. And all the roles that I got were this lady, this, this the, the, the uh, procedural woman who pops her head out of her trailer going, you know, I didn't kill him, but I ain't sorry he's dead. <laughs> That's, I, was, I was kept getting that, this idiot. And I'm like, no, my father was a NASA physicist. My mother was a teacher. I have 160 IQ. I don't want to play stupid all my life because they decided that if you were curvy and ethnic and had big boobs, that's what you were. So I dyed my hair red. And I said to my colorist, Tracy Cunningham, she does all the best people. <laughs> I said, I said, I want to get, I want to play a lawyer or a teacher mm. or the boss. I don't want to play that woman anymore. So that's what I got. But you know, it's I got Abbott and a bunch of other stuff before Abbott. But you know, then they, I'm still playing, you know, a woman who knows someone who has this accent because you know you got to you know, play what you're supposed to be and where you come from, so. <laughs> so you, my answer to you is don't wait for them to tell you what you can play. Mm. You play what you, you go out for the role, you land the jobs, you do the work, and, you know, I mean, to me from here, you look like Meryl Streep. <laughs> I mean, you look very much like Meryl Streep, for real. <laughs> Meryl Streep, you know, went to also a, a very good school. She went to Yale. It's not as good as Brown. Like, my daughter probably could have gotten into Yale. But, but I mean, and, and she played all different kinds of roles and changed herself and her appearance for everything. So, your actors, your chameleons, don't let them tell you. Thank you so much. Uh-huh. Go get it, kid. Yeah. Yeah. Well, first, Lisa, thank you so much for being here. We all appreciate your presence and especially your insights about balancing your work as well as being a single mom. Mm -hmm. um, so I'd like to know how your experiences in the industry have informed your approach to motherhood, if they have in any way. Well, I will say that it certainly um, made me not put my kids in the industry. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's t terrible to say. They're wonderful. We work with incredible young actors on our show all the time. But part of that has to do with the fact that the people running our show are good people. And we hire good teachers, set teachers, who have the kids' best interests at heart. Nobody is trying to get extra hours of work out of them. Nobody is trying to um, abuse them. But I've seen it done. I've seen it with, with children that they are uh, you know, made to do things. Or if a kid is the heavy kid in the movie, all the jokes are fat jokes. And it just, it breaks my heart. I'm like, how are you a mother? And you know that's the script and you put your kid, I was the fat kid growing up and being tortured about being heavy is humiliating. It's, it's, it's soul sucking, it's just sad. And I don't know how a parent could know that their kid's going to be the butt of that and put them in a project. I don't care how badly they want their kids to, you know, be famous or whatever. But um, I think in terms of being a mother myself, anytime a woman is doing the thing that she loves, that she's passionate about, that she's known her whole life she wants to, to do and be successful at, she's teaching her kids mm -hmm. how to be a woman in this world. So me going after my job, I've, I've been around, been lucky enough to be around for my kids, for the mo but not all of it. You know, when I was starring in a TV show, I was not there for my daughter. I had to have a nanny. I never thought in a million years I would. And that was weird, and I didn't like it. I didn't like someone else raising my child, because I was there for my son, mm -hmm. my oldest. 
And then the twins, I was starring in TV shows. I had to go to Canada to, to do Shall We Dance when they were just not even two years old. And my ex, I had two exes. All right, here's the joke. <laughs> I, I have two exes. The first one is a lovely Jewish man. Turned out we had too much in common. He also liked men. <laughs> That'll do it. <laughs> Whoops. Happens. Second one was a cheater, which is not technically a religion, but he practiced it like it was. <laughs> yeah. He was orthodox. That'll also do it. Yeah. yeah. So he was busy catting around, and I was doing Shall We Dance, and I had to, make the, I had to bring the kids up with me to Canada to be there while I did the movie. And like, and people were lovely. Stanley Tucci was like, I have a bigger trailer. You could bring your kids into my trailer. Don't worry about anything. Mm -hmm. And I had my kids with me while I was, so I was working all day long, 16 hour days, then going back to a hotel room. We had another little room next to it. And I was a mom in the, in the nighttime. But the, when they got a little bit older, I was home with them. I did not take movies anymore. In fact, that was probably at a period of time where you didn't see me so much was because I was raising my kids because their father was not doing a dad job. That was good. I was good right there. Do you see that? <laughs> I, was, I was very good. Sensitive. Well done, Lisa. <laughs> so um, he wasn't really doing a dad job. And I was, bye, ladies. I'm sorry, did I hurt your feelings? <laughs> <laughs> you have to go. All right, bye. Bye. Um, so I, I had to stay home. I took a job on local. I was a talk show host for three years on KFI. I wrote a book called The Best Thing About My Ass Is That It's Behind Me. Yeah, and I don't did. have to look at it all the time, which is about women and self-esteem and all the pressure we put ourselves under. So, I mean, I think it's just uh, you take whatever it is that you do with your, with your career, uh, how you do it and how you live your life teaches your kids. And certainly, they're all feminist, all of my kids, three boys and the girl. And um, they all know, understand that I'm an activist, and they are too. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, the twins aren't as yet, but they spend a lot of time gaming. <laughs> I'm sure they will be when they stop gaming. Um, so we've talked about how this show really depicts a real world, but also depicts a world that not a lot of people have seen. Um, so what are some of the that you've been taught by the show or that you would see, that you would want to see a lot of other people um, take away from the show? This is what I've been taught by the show? Well, you know, I grew up in D.C., and my mother was a public school teacher in D.C. The first time that I was in an environment that was more white than not was when I went to college. That felt weird to me. Mm -hmm. It was incredibly weird. I, I had never been in a population like that. And they all came from, like, the Northeast, right? <laughs> I went to Catholic University in D.C., and then it was... I think it's gotten better now, but it was really, really white. And so I, I, was, I would say I was used to, and I was in public school my whole life. So that environment feels, that feels like my childhood. That's, I'll be honest with you. The set that I work on is the most effusive, warm, welcoming, real set full of people that I've ever been on. And we have, it's not just um, the mostly, mostly black, but we have others too in the student body and our, and our mostly black cast. It's behind the camera too. We have a, an incredibly diverse camera crew. All, all the departments are very, very diverse. And it is, that feels normal to me. So pro projecting that within the world of the show I'll, I'll tell you what I said to Quinta when we started. Because we were in a time in this country, and still are if you're looking at Tennessee, right? Mm -hmm. It varies on where you're from and where you live. I remember when I was doing stand-up, my mother said to me, I was touring all over the place, and I went to, I was in Louisiana, in Shreveport. And she said, well, I feel like things have, and she's been in D.C. now 30 plus years, right? She came out of New York. She goes, well, at least we're, we don't have as much racism anymore. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. And I said, Ma, you haven't been out of D.C. in a minute. I was like, it's, I was shocked too. But there were people using words to me, you know the words, mm -hmm. because they thought I was on their team. And I was like, I'm not on your team. 
don't use that language with me. And it is a world out there, this is what I said to Quinta, that more than ever before needs to see these incredible characters and these beautiful children and these engaging stories being told about people of color. And I think that it's, uh, it's great that people can, can see it on this show. I mean, it's not like we haven't had shows with mostly black cast before, but I think in this one in particular that we are showing black male teachers, mm -hmm. which was a, a big thing and, and purposeful that they're showing that you know, he's trying to date, but he's not making as much money as maybe some other profession and what that means to him in terms of as he moves forward in his, in his career. You know, that he had bigger, his eyes set on, you know, school superintendent, principal, you know, bigger, bigger, bigger jobs. And it turns out he, he actually really loves teaching. So I think those stories are incredibly important. And um, I learn stuff all the time. In ter terms of specifics, like I didn't know what... Um, I gotta get this right. I'm gonna dip set like Cameron. I had no <laughs> idea what that meant. I literally did not understand any of that. I was like, Janelle, what's dip set like Cameron mean? And if she was like, oh, better, dip, like leave. Cameron, like, you don't need to know. It means he's leaving. <laughs> I was like, all right. <laughs> but I learned that stuff. Those are finite things. I learned that every day. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Um, if you had to teach elementary school, what grade would you choose to teach and why? Uh -huh. Sixth grade mm. and U.S. politics and government. Yeah. And you know why. We do know why. Because <laughs> people need to learn. They need to learn early and they need to continue to learn. And they don't know and they need to know. Mm -hmm. Y'all register to vote, right? Okay, this was one not part of this, but. Yes. How do you think Melissa would have reacted to the Eagles losing the Super Bowl? Oh, oh, Melissa's still, she hasn't gotten out of bed yet. <laughs> she's, still, she's still mad. Yeah. She's probably, she's probably found out the addresses of some of the players and she's gone to their house. She does not blame Jalen Hurts, though. <laughs> she does not. It's everybody else's fault, but not his. Yeah. She was like, you know, she's, you know who she's found out the addresses of is the refs. Is that call? There are a couple calls in the sec, guys. There were some calls. Yeah, yeah, it did not make sense. Um, thank you so much for being here. Um, how do you make sure fans like me or friends and your friends, family members, um, can separate you, like, can separate the Chessies and the Debbies and the um, Bobbies and Melissas from Melissa and make sure that you as a person still shine through in your life and your work? You mean with the people that know me? Or just with your fans, like do you ever find that oh, people with fans? see you as like, oh, yeah. that's Jesse instead of... You know what, here's the thing. I, again, over the years I've had so many beautiful, you know, statements of I just feel like if I got a hug from Chessy, everything would mm -hmm. be okay. And so when fans come to see me, when they come to see like a stand-up show, if, they're, if they wait around afterwards, and sometimes like last night when I was in Boston, there was a line of 100 people and everybody wants a hug. And I'm like, you know what, I've already gotten... COVID a couple times, I'm probably all right. <laughs> probably okay. Take one for the and, team. you know, it's like my, yeah, it's, like, it's, it's kind of an honor to be mm. seen partially as that character. So that part of it, I, I don't mind. Nobody sees me as Bobby. He's talking about shall we dance. But people don't really see me as that because that was some crazy wardrobe <laughs> and hair. But, but, but except for to, today when they had, a, they had a ballroom competition at the hotel I was at, in Boston, and I actually, last night after the show, was walking across the lobby, and I saw my teacher, who was a Dancing with the Stars pro, Tony Dovolani. He was my main teacher on Shall We Dance, and he was standing right there in the lobby. I was like, what are you, are you kidding? And so <laughs> today I went downstairs and was hanging out with the ballroom dancers, and they know me as Bobby, but I just think that's cool. I just, I want to dance with them, so that's fine. <laughs> um, the people in my life know I'm not my characters, because I just sit in the bark lounger and yell at the NFL, or... <laughs> or MSNBC, usually it's yeah. the news, and I just, I'm just in the house with no makeup on, yeah.
And my kids have literally zero respect for my career, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that. I will say, my daughter, we were talking about this too. My daughter watches, she had comfort movies, like um, growing up, she couldn't sleep, so she would watch uh, Jerry Maguire, Grease. There were like a couple of movies that she watched. None of mine. None of yours. I've heard from other people that they've watched Parent Trap to go to sleep, but not mine. But you, so, you're her comfort person. Okay. I, no, no, <laughs> with my daughter, I better. will agree to that. She was, she, she had anxiety and stuff, and I suffered. It's, it's, a, it's a family thing. It's genetic, right? So my grandfather, my mother. Not even Bruce Almighty. Not even Bruce Almighty. Mm -hmm. Although Quinta watched Bruce Almighty. That was her comfort movie. When she went through a bad breakup in college, that was the movie she put on to fall asleep. So maybe that's why I got a job. Aww. Yeah, I hope so. Almighty. Yeah. yeah, so I think, you know, that being that person for people, that I don't mind at all. And if my kids, it's, it's really the twins that haven't watched Abbott yet. The older two. They, my son saw it, because I started when he, like I said, he was just about a year old when I started doing stand-up, and I used to practice in front of him when he was a baby, Aww. which I probably shouldn't have. <laughs> He would grab a spoon and go, I do comedy. Ah! And he just yell. <laughs> but he grew up, he's still one of the funniest people I know. He's like, he's, my, he's going with me to the Moon Tower Comedy Festival in Austin this weekend coming up. Yeah, awesome. so he's, he's great. He developed a really good sense of humor and saw me doing the different comedy gigs. would go on the road when you know my, my ex-husband was bringing my daughter so that I could run back to the hotel and nurse her in between sets. Mm -hmm. My son was there too, so he was there with me throughout the years, you know, as he was growing up. And I think for that reason, he respects what I do, because he saw the fight. He saw the, listen, nobody gave me nothing, y'all. I, I deserve every penny. You <laughs> I'm not kidding. Yeah. When you, you know, when I, I would leave the house in Jersey and drive for a one night or out in Long Island or Massachusetts and drive home the same night so I could save the 26 bucks on the hotel room. I'd come home from freaking Springfield to New Jersey mm -hmm. and the same night as a show. Be, so, you know, listen, when, you, when you're an animal and fighting for it, you just, you do what it takes. Yes. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Yes, one more question. <laughs> All yours. Great, thank you. And as everyone else said, thank you so much for being here. It's really been a pleasure um, listening thank to you. you. But as you were just saying, speaking of fighting um, for what you deserve and to get where you need to go, mm -hmm. uh, we've talked a lot about how teachers are not a group of people who are receiving essentially any support mm -hmm. in the U.S. right now, and this might be the only support that a lot of them see for themselves, the most mm -hmm. positive representations sure. that I've personally seen of public school teachers um, in media. What is the most meaningful thing, especially where so many of the cast members, um, from what I've heard, have family, like yourself, yes. who have been public teachers? And Cheryl, and of course, Quinta, who's yes. based this entire show on her mom's public okay. school teaching career. That's a great question. Yeah, so what Thank is the most much. meaningful thing you've heard, or most meaningful thing for you to get to portray that? You know, I mean, do, playing a, a, a teacher of, a, of an urban school, of a mostly black school, as a Sicilian teacher, was, first of all, an incredible blessing for me to do as an homage to my mother, mm -hmm. who, I don't know if you saw this in an interview, but she was, had been quite sick for a long time. She had um, uh, congestive heart failure and had been, you know, was on her second valve replacement and she was going into the hospital right after we just, she was staying with me during COVID, so I got to like take care of her for months at a time. But when we shot the pilot, she was not with me. Mm -hmm. And then she went back into the hospital right after we shot the pilot, about a month later. And she was doing quite badly and it didn't look good. And um, I had been sort of her major caretaker for a lot of years. And I, I called Quinta, I said to my mom, um, you, you know, I've, I've done a project. I, here's the thing, I should take a step back. I never would tell my mom when I would do a, a project or shoot something, because we're very, um, uh, Sicilians are, are very um, superstitious. And whenever <laughs> I told my mom about something, the project didn't go, so I stopped telling her. And yeah. even she would ask me, she would say like, no, but what is it, didn't you do a job? Oh, I'm not supposed to ask. And I'm like, yeah, don't say anything. So. When, when I shot this, she didn't know anything about it. She didn't know I was playing a Sicilian school teacher. It was basically her, um, or members of our family, you know, that I based Melissa off of. 
when she went into the hospital, I said, I did this job. And um, it's really good. So you you got to get better. And she was like, I don't know. I don't, when's it going to come? And she was like, can you talk about it? You're not supposed to talk about it. And I was like, oh, my God, should I talk about it? And then she thinks, oh, I'm definitely dying if I talk about it. <laughs> I'm like, literally, this is what's going through my head. And she goes, uh, she goes, well, I don't know if I'm going to be around when it comes out. And I said, I said, you will be. You have to be because it's for you. And she, when she got real sick, um, I said, I, ca I called my manager and I said, please have Quinta send me a copy of the pilot for my mom to, to see. Listen, it has to be soon. And I had it in three minutes. Mm -hmm. And here's what you have to know. You're not allowed to share pilots before they're ready for air. You're really not. It's against all the rules. I had it on my phone in three minutes. And I was able to show my mother. And I was able to tell her, I'm OK. I'll be safe. And this is you. This is for you. And she said, teachers don't get love in this country. And this is a love letter. And this is what you guys need to know. Sorry, I didn't mean to go there with you guys. I really didn't. But teachers have been historically undervalued in this country because it has always been a female profession. Mm -hmm. So they are paid less than they're worth, and they are valued less than they're worth because it's just women doing it for the longest time, right? So, and now we have added on top of that the extra bonus of them being second-guessed about everything that they do from their lesson plans to what they say to the books they choose to give their students. Although for some reason those same people that want to take away their right to you know, give them books in their classroom want to give them a gun. So I don't know what that <laughs> says yeah. about their idea of what their, you know, their, their uh, cognitive uh, abilities are, but <laughs> apparently they want them to be able to shoot people but not tell them what to read. Um, but I, I think that the best thing that we hear, every day we hear from teachers, you, you've, you've really captured us. You really understand us. You value teachers. You acknowledge us, all of those wonderful words. They feel seen. They feel seen and they feel respected, and they feel like we are an extension of them. They dress up like our characters in their school. You know, you're the Jacob, you're the Quinta, the Janine, you know. And I think that just being seen as fully formed, fleshed out human beings, and not just the teacher in the school, but a person, is incredibly meaningful to them at this time when they are being undervalued not just financially, but in many ways in this country. And the best thing that I've heard that they write to us is, I stopped going for my teacher's credentials, and this show made me go back and get them. Mm. So that's incredibly, I mean, for on the one hand, <laughs> Quint and I both like, that's great, but is it? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yay, but mm. So yeah, that's the, that's the best thing that we hear. You're welcome. That's incredible. What a wonderful last question from the audience. I just want to say that there are moments like these. You are also a teacher. And Thank so it's you. not just through Abbott that you're able to honor your mother. It's you coming out here and telling us to never give up and to yeah, not don't, wait. Don't you guys. Everybody yeah. pinky square. Make a promise. Never give up. Never, never surrender. Never give up. So thank you for being our teacher this evening. Oh, you're welcome. Um, it has my been pleasure. lovely to be in conversation with you. Thank you. And thank you. Everyone, all. give it up for Lisa.